Uh, good evening and welcome to you in Radio Land at home and abroad on Facebook. We are live on Facebook at WICE QFM on the Q95 FM radio. And um, wherever you are on whatever other networks and platforms that you are, we acknowledge you on the several online streaming platforms. This is the Global View on Q. It's Tuesday, 22nd June. It's just about at 10, at 10 minutes after 8 p.m. We're starting a little bit late tonight for good reasons. And in the studio at Q95, so the big station. I'm your host, Sheridan Gregoire, Mr. G. I'm delighted to have the very good and illustrious company of Dr. Andre in Canada, political scientist, Dr. Dion George in Georgia, construction engineer and manager, Anthony Libla in Dominica, and former ambassador Crispin Gregoire is also in Dominica. It is the 24th Tuesday of 2021, and it is the year, as we always say, to revive the spirit of graciousness, of love, of peace, of prosperity, and unity among Kanago and Afro Caribbean people. We're always live, as we say on Facebook, and so on. And so you can find your Q family, like our page, share our page right now, and get regular notifications of what's happening, the latest breaking local, regional, and international happenings. The big issues remain electoral reform, campaign finance reform, crisis of governance, unaccounted CDI funds. How did we get to this state where foreign entities dominate Dominica's development at the expense of local investors, entrepreneurs, and our own public works corporation as manifested in so many no-bid projects? by the construction of a proposed international airport, hospitals, schools, houses, health centers, roads, bridges, among many others, and thereby denying growth of indigenous enterprises, skills, and talents. I look forward to my guests assisting us with the answers to a few of these questions. Like what are the issues and developments that led to the appointment and intervention by Sir Dennis Byron as a social consultant for making recommendations for electoral reforms in Dominica. And why, in fact, indeed, does the government of Dominica appear to view Sir Dennis Byron as its savior from genuine electoral reforms and campaign finance reform? We all remember the fifth email madness at the Electoral Commission, your winning legacy may be affected. Right? So, is Dominica's democracy at stake? And if so, why is that so? And what should we do? It is clear that all of us Dominicans at home and abroad must rise to the challenge of protecting and sustaining our democracy by clothing and fortifying ourselves in the arm of organization, information, preparation. That is one of the reasons that I'm so delighted to have tonight Dr. Irvin Andre, political scientist, Dr. George, Construction engineer and manager Anthony Leblanc, former ambassador Chris Gregoire in Dominica. They're with us tonight to discuss the good, the bad, the ugly, and the dangerous. With no anger, of course, no malice, no personal attack, no vilification, no divisiveness, bringing back civility, a caring society, good governance, proper electoral reforms, and campaign finance reforms. But we continue to recognize the imperative to eliminate poverty. That's why we're doing all of this, aren't we? To stop corruption, to generate real income, and higher living standards, a better quality of life and health, justice without delays, and the resilient sustainability of our Kalinago and Afro-Caribbean brothers and sisters. So don't go anywhere. Keep it locked right here in this space for another great debate. Let the answers to your questions wherever you are in Dominica, in the religion, in religion. join this conversation on Global View on Q. Have you say every Tuesday with me, Mr. G, only on Q95, the big station. So let us remind ourselves, of course, that the genesis of this controversy, electoral reform and campaign finance reform, as we said, was that famous email that advised Prime Minister Skerritt. There was madness going on at the Electoral Commission because they were talking about electoral reforms that could affect the prime minister's election winning legacy <laughs> members of the commission would change as a result and now there are three alleged passport sellers on the government side of the commission 
The DLP government has now contracted to Dennis Byron to make recommendations for electoral reform. And Prime Minister Scarry challenged opposition leader Lennox, Lennox, Lennox Linton to agree that as soon as Sir Dennis's recommendations are submitted, it should be taken to Parliament immediately and passed into law. But alas, Byron appears to be off to a bit of a shaky start with an uncontrolled opening in online questionnaire that he has Dominican to fill out and submit. There are questions about this questionnaire. Most people say the answer is that it should not be used at all. It should be thrown out. But however, we look forward to Sir Byron ultimately convening a conference of all parties, finally. And I believe he has promised to do so, including the Dominican Labour Party as well as NGOs and civil societies to make their case based on the materials that they have already submitted to the Commission, along with the recommendations that have already been made by reputable international agencies such as the OAS. And these recommendations altogether include campaign finance reforms as well. There are also recordings of several substantial radio discussions that contain specific detailed recommendations for electoral reform and campaign reform for Dominica. Case studies, the experiences of Jamaica, St. Pete's, and Barbados, and I'm sure that we will refer to them tonight, our illustrious guests. Yeah, we'll do that. Most right thinking Dominicans at home and abroad are of the view that any recommendations from Sir Dennis Byron, which do not result, from such an inclusive conference of all parties, as as mentioned earlier, that do not take into account the experience of our Caribbean sister islands as cities, should be rejected and should not be brought anywhere close to the Dominica's parliament for consideration. That's what our thinking is. Justice must appear to be done, but the antics of those with political influence makes it seem impossible, as justice cannot be dispensed on the basis of political colors. Together, we must all face the challenge of protecting our democracy, preserving our constitution, and observe, observing our laws. But let us continue, however, to also remind ourselves that Dominica still has too much widespread poverty, too much mendicancy and unemployment, insufficient jobs, abuse of women's rights and children and elderly, inadequate housing, increasingly brutal crimes, a struggling economy, insufficient affordable housing and health insurance and health care. Up to today, we are hearing equipment operators from Dominica going to go on strike and block roads. And then ultimately, they seem to have had their way and they got the jobs. That's what we're saying. Yes. You know, why do we want to give up to just foreign entities and locals have to stand on the side and look? So misdirected and misguided foreign policies and conduct that damages our international image. None of that, of course, is driven by our planned domestic economic and cultural interests. And has mostly resulted in this questionable diminishing mono foreign earnings transport sales driven economy. Weak financial management translates into expensive waste of resources. None of this is eliminating poverty and employment. None of it is generating optimal wealth for Dominica. None of it is eliminated is lingering mendicancy and dependency on handouts or helping our people to maintain good health or become wealthy enough for a good sustainable job or through their own enterprise by utilizing and adding value to our national human resources or enable our people to take care of themselves and their families by ensuring a better quality of life and better living standards. We still have a minimum wage for God's sake of $4.50 per hour. So as usual, we discuss, we recommend, we decide what you think about the information we disseminate. And so we say a heartfelt thank you to all healthcare providers and frontline workers as we begin. In this continuing dreaded COVID-19 situation, please follow the guidelines and protocols. Be sure to play it safe and uh, stay alive. So we shout out all of our Q family listeners that are joining us at home and abroad. Happy to have you with us tonight. Whenever you are, wherever you are in your neck of the woods, in every community in Dominica, in the region, in the global community. So later this evening, I'm sure a little later on, Lambi will give you the, the numbers. Lambi is on the console. You'll take your numbers directly in the traffic. And our engineer, Shobin Norris, as usual, will keep us on the air. So let's get to work. Gentlemen, our engineer, Shobin Norris, is, is doing his job and they, they're ready for us. So. Um, let me say this, I want to go first to our prolific historian and author, 
of many outstanding okay. books and publications, Dr. Irving Andrew, to make his opening remarks and to get the ball rolling with his initial okay. contribution to the conversation. But I do hope that the few words that I've said here in my opening remarks have helped in some small way and some small measure to reasonably frame the big picture and the platform or launch pad for our dial tonight. And I hope that our little song with the mighty sparrow, I'll be there. I set the tone for our amicable discussion tonight. So I look forward to Justice Andre also educating us on some of these troubling issues. So Dr. Andre, let me go over to you to get the ball rolling. Well, let me say good night, uh, Mr. G. Uh, let me thank you for, for inviting me uh, to say my little uh, piece. Um, in this extraordinary session, um, uh, we have some wonderful guests, panelists, um, Professor George, Anthony Lebla, we have Crispin, we have Brother Lambie and Barry Sherwin, and we have yourself. Let me also say good evening to your wonderful listeners um, uh, of all political stripes, social and other types of stripes. Let me also, before I really launch into my little epistle, so to speak, uh, commend the 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 sopranos, the lawyers, the, the Emilio Charles, Ronald Charles, uh, Professor Wiltshire, Joshua Francis. They were firing on four cylinders. Well, actually, make it eight. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen to the respective contributions of these illustrious ones uh, of Dominica. Uh, Mr. Gregor, I have to give it to you and the mighty sparrow because for some inexplicable reason. You choose a song which speaks in a very eloquent fashion about the existential chasm that we face in Dominica as we speak. The lyrics of Sparrow's song can be also be can almost be seen as a love letter from the government of the political directorate to Lord Byron. And let me meditate on some of those lyrics, and that will explain why I think why I think this way. And I'll try to explain it as best as I can. Some of the lyrics go as follows. I bless the day I found you. And I'll see why that is such a tool of endearment to Lord Byron. I want to be around you. I'll reach out my hands to you. That's what they've done. I'll have faith in all you do. And bear in mind, they were already predicted and asking Lennox Linton to join us to make whatever the Baron says into law. But here's a lovely point and verse. I saw you from my window. What a nice window. My heart stood a beat, Lord Byron. Each time we meet love or whatever it is. Without your sweet love, what would my legacy be? How timely and appropriate are these lyrics? Sparrow is a genius. And Sparrow also says that. The person he speaks and writes about is torn between two lovers. So you have democracy on one side. Democracy is represented by the, the baby mother. The baby mother is the one who is always overlooked. The baby mother democracy is the one who has to beg for jobs for her, her children the one who is not given any benefits. But the lovely, beautiful lady on the hill is autocracy. And autocracy receives all the benefits and the fringe benefits of lucre and illegal gain. The cars, the security, the commissions, the help that the baby mother doesn't receive. And this is what Sparrow is saying to us in our song. Look at the contrast and ask yourself, where are you? And make no mistake about this. Lord Byron, the intention is for him to deliver the kind of reforms that the directorate wants. Let's have no illusion about this. Because look at this. There was a report from someone called Mia Motley. I don't know who she is. She's probably from Monstrad. What do I know? What did they do with it? 
ask Wayne James, ask Hillary Schlingford. They dumped it in the garbage. Why? Because the last thing they wanted to hear about in so far as electoral reform is concerned is cleaning the voters list, is instituting campaign reform, finance reform, is protecting the integrity of the electoral process. Then that tri tripartite commission constituted by the OS, the Commonwealth Secretariat and this other body, they came up in 2019, if my memory serves me right, with another platform of electoral reform as it is known in all democratic countries. There were pronouncements that the institution of those reforms would be too expensive. There's no time notwithstanding the fact that Antigua could have done it in three months and Antigua has a bigger population based in Dominica. What about the, the reforms proposed by Pastor Rodney who took time off from saving souls to trying to save democracy? What happened to it? It was cast by the wayside like an unholy demon. That is not what they want. So hence the love letter to Lord Byron, save us, save us. So all this flim flam, all this masquerade about, about, about consultation. It goes nowhere. It will go nowhere unless Lord Byron doesn't reciprocate that love which has been, been expressed to him. Unless he doesn't reciprocate that love which is being extended to him. What we will have is what is being sought. Electoral of reform which represents a negation of what has happened in Jamaica, what has happened in Antigua, what has happened in Barbados, what has happened in Trinidad and Tobago, what has happened in St. Lucia. Because it's electoral reform, which would, as we hinted earlier on, perpetuate a legacy, which would ensure that little, little Putin take over at the appropriate time. That is what is staring Dominic in the face. Some of your listeners may not want to hear it. Some of them may pontificate piously, but let's wait and see what we'll deliver. But the evidence is clear. Because if we were interested in genuine electoral reform, we wouldn't be spending all this money because we know what it is about. We know what free and fair elections are about. But that is not the goal. The primary focus on this thing is to justify and legitimize the participation of foreign persons in Dominica's electoral process. And make no mistake about it. Those who will be registering these so-called foreign-based Dominicans will do so selectively. They will not express an open invitation to, to, to document everybody. That is not the goal. The goal is to represent or to elect, not elect, I'm sorry, to register those who will deliver the goods in so far as elections are concerned. Once you have such a system, as I said, you can go and ask Bishop Malze, Archbishop, yes, yeah, sorry, for a spot in the Rosa Cemetery, because I'm told that the spots are getting scarcer and scarcer. Ask him to reserve a spot for democracy because it will be dead. And Lazarus died long ago. So this is the junction. This is the reality that scares us in the face. And it's just not a matter of voting. This has implications for virtually every component of Dominican's democratic way of life. I mean, we have, for example, Tony LeBlanc, who's a panelist. And Tony LeBlanc, like many others, Mackenzie Silver, those who have felt the wrath of victimization. On his body, you have the wells, the scars, the lacerations, 
of rampant victimization, qualified in their country, a country which had faced a devastating blow in 2017 after Maria, where there should be jobs galore for Dominicans to feed their children, send them to school, to build homes, to become financially independent, to gain a sense of maturity and integrity. These are being, they have been deprived of these things. The public was shut down. Why? So that cronies, cronies can share the loot among themselves. Certain pastors abandoned their flock and drive in air conditioned SUVs, courtesy duty free confessing, while pontificating about God the Father. Charlatans can go on stages with the horns of goats, proclaiming some type of divine, divine message, which they can only preach after receiving a fat check or wad of money in their hands to enable them to go back to the islands. And we are left stagnating. We are left in that cesspool of retardation victimization of going back rather than going forward. But this is what we are talking about. We're not talking about the luxury of voting every five years or four, whatever it is. We're talking about the future of the island. We're talking about your ability to earn a decent living in your own country. We're talking about the expropriation of the wealth of the island by mysterious persons who are paid fat commissions and they disappear into the night. We're talking about ambassadors. You only know the names. Zandoli, I'm sorry, Zampoli is what I meant to say. Threatening or suing for 30 million US dollars when the majority of, well, a significant portion of Dominica do not even earn $30,000 a year. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about croppers with the big tons with capacities of tons having to resort to strike down to get a piece of the pie when it is foreign owned transportation that is gaining all the advantages in their own land. Mr. G, you are a much traveled man. My travels are unfortunately limited to Balahu town. But in your travels, would that happen in Jamaica? Or Antigua? Or St. Kitts? Or Trinidad and Tobago? How long do you think a government would last when all the jobs construction projects, the airport, I put airport in quote unquote, because I'm one of the naysayers to be quite frank with you, are being given to foreign entities. We all know the proceeds or much a significant portion of the net proceeds of sale of passport have been deposited in mysterious accounts, according to Zampoli, and he knows better than all of us. And some of these same funds have been loaned to us. How much of a fraud in any other democratic country criminal charges would be flying like souvenirs all over the place? But what about the law enforcement? They're fast asleep. They're jumping on SUVs and running to, to Tatan as part of a conspiracy to deprive an Antiguan citizen of his rights. That is the focus of law enforcement in Dominica today. Law enforcement, which basically buttresses and which provides a scaffolding for everything wrong that is going on in Dominica. While I speak to you, Mr. G, I'm meditating on the lyrics of the mighty Sparrow, who over and over again in so many songs speak to us, Caribbean people in a very eloquent and profound fashion. But the fundamental question is simple. Are we listening? And I end on that note. Thank you.
All right, well, thanks a lot, Dr. Andre. And um, a mouthful as usual. And uh, thank you for all your learned words there. And, but it sort of leaves me with the, I sort of sense as if, well, this whole winning legacy thing has resulted in all of what you're talking about there. And is that the continuation of that winning legacy? Is that what it's meant? Is that what it's intended? Is that what could be the result? Could it be worse? Could it get worse? So when we talk about electoral reform for the purpose of really having genuine free and fair elections, so to preserve our democracy, should it be about winning legacies or should it really be about the good fortunes of the people? looking up the people, reducing things like poverty and ensuring that locals get the jobs and they get the best deals. And Dominicans, born and bred Dominicans, are given the opportunity to grow, to see how the economy expand. Isn't that what the winning legacy should be about? Isn't that what many governments have come before? They're for the little man. We saw Edward LeBlanc, he, came, he empowered the farmers. Farmers got wealthy, they could take care of their families. That is why Edward LeBlanc won elections. We saw Patrick John come after him. It was for the little man. He did quite a bit. He put a bang there when ordinary people's children could not go and work in banks. He put a bang there and Macmillan Dorival became the first manager and ordinary people's children got jobs there. The social security came about to empowered people. You know, so we saw winning legacies of people before. Those translated into meaningful jobs and things of substance for the people. So as I go to um, Anthony LeBlanc, our learned friend, who made such a fantastic presentation at that business forum conference in dialoguing with Sir, Sir Byron. Anthony LeBlanc, give us the wisdom of some of those presentations that you made. And I believe they had impact. And if they do, if the recommendations that you made do not find their way and are reflected in that report that goes to the, um, to the commission, I'll be very surprised. What should I be? Andrew Libla, over to you. Oh, good evening, um, Gregor, and good evening, Q95 listeners. Good evening to my esteemed panelists. Um, yeah, I imagine that's the reason why we're making these recommendations, because we wanted to get into that report, into his recommendations. Um, I, I will start off by saying the issue that we have had over the years with electoral reforms and the various studies and recommendation is implementation. Um, practically none of the reform recommendations have been implemented. Um, you go back to pre-2009, um, you go back a very long time. Um, as far back as 1985, there was a recommendation for ID cards, for example. So we go back a long time and the issue has been recommendations, um, implementation. Um, in 2019, when the current administration called the OAS and the CARICOM and um, the Commonwealth to come and advise the country on electoral reform, the assumption was that the recommendations were going to be implemented. Within hours of the report, the Attorney General's office says that they are too expensive. And how could they be too expensive when they were the very recommendations of the Electoral Commission itself, who said it received enough funds to implement the recommendations? It was the very recommendations that we made as the Electoral Reform Group. And the time frames were also within that period. And there's no doubt that the election was called very early to make sure we didn't have the time. So going back to what we expect from the electoral reform um, or any electoral reform, it has to, at the end of the day, result, a desirable result of any good reform is that it provides that environment that setting where from the start of the campaigning to the polling day, voters will perceive and accept that the processes, the activities are being conducted transparently and fairly, and the results are to be honored. 
The joint mission, mission from the Commonwealth and the OS reminds us that electoral reform should be ideally a continuous process. It shouldn't be jumped on before an election only. It shouldn't be jumped on after a lot of pressure before the last election and we hire somebody or hire a team to study it. We know where the reforms are. There have been several recommendations. And at the end of the day, going forward, we have to look at the campaign financing, the access the, to, to, to media and minimizing the advantage of the incumbency. Um, constituency boundary redistribution, that reform has to come become part of it. Um, we also need to look at whether there should be set boundaries for calling the general elections. It cannot be that one individual can just get up today and say, hey, election, ele election tomorrow without any regard for the process of getting to a general election, without any regard for whether the primary list have errors and whether there's time to deal with the objections, to deal with corrections. Um, it, it doesn't make sense. That cannot be reform. So reform have to take those things into, um, into perspective. But importantly, reform have to deal with the constitutional provisions about the electoral commission, its constitution, its financing, its independence, its powers. So at the end of the day, if we want good electoral reform, we have to look at that. And importantly enough, we have to look at the voter, voter registration, voter verification, voter identification, because that's who are the people who go in to vote. That's how we're going to get a new government. And if we look back at the recommendations we had, we had recommendations from the Commonwealth Observer Mission in 2014 after the election that says the list currently complies with the legislation, but it is widely discredited. There appears to be credible public appetite for the revision of the legislation guiding the compilation of the voters list. In effect, it's saying the legislation needs to be reviewed because as it is, the list we have is not what's desirable. It's not credible. And we have to go through a process of cleaning up that list. The commission itself recommended voter verification identification. We agree with the commission on that. The OECS and CARICOM and the Commonwealth um, Observer Persons and the mission that we had in 2019 that gave its report in September of 2019 agreed that the verification exercise is the best way, the most efficient way of cleaning the list, of making sure that people are reassigned to their respective polling district and police, polling stations. At the end of the day, election is about voting as residents, voting where you live. And it's about residents voting. It's also the most effective way to identify people and give them voting voter IDs. So the, that house to house verification exercise is what we all know. All of us know that the electoral commission, the, the, the missions that came and all of us, all the parties know that the best way to clean up the list is a verification exercise. But we also have an issue with the registration and we need registration reform. While we speak about having an ID to vote, there's currently no requirement to have an ID to register. So before the last election, what we had is the registration officer being barraged with persons to register. Um, there's no mechanism to identify those persons. Somebody come and say, this person is my constituency. Um, I know the person saying that, so I believe them. I register the person. And we had the issue of double registration. We had the issue of not, well, currently there is no means to check whether that person is registered in Cassibus that is coming to register in, in Trafalgar. So we have this issue of multiple registration going on as well. And, and besides not being able to identify that John Brown is John Brown, who is registering, we have the issue that 
there's no protocol. The registration registering officer has nothing to go by where he can reject somebody or not, or there's not adequate in these modern times. And at the end of the day, we go back to ID cards. The time limit for indelible ink has gone, has come and gone. It has been established since 1985. It is 2021. You do the maps. That is 40 years, almost 40 years that we have been using indelible ink. But there is the issue of whether it should be a national ID card or voter ID card. Those things have to be discussed properly and we have to come not necessarily as a consensus, but we have to do the right thing. Does the commission really have power over a national ID card? And should the commission have power over a national ID card? And then we have to decide about biometrics. The commission position before the last election is that it wanted comprehensive biometrics. Basically, the commission is saying everything that can identify you, it wants. It wants to know the distance between your eye pupil. It wants to know how your nose is shaped. It wants to know everything. But the passport that we have to go to the US, to go to Barbados, only has a photograph. Why do we want the ex extensive biometrics as an identification requirement? At the end of the day, there have been challenges in the Caribbean about its comprehensive biometrics. We have had the experience of Jamaica. And are we going to have a hiccup on election day because somebody has put an injunction in the courts and say that I don't agree that that should be used to identify me? And then we have the five-year amendment. We need to amend the legislation that it deals with the five year in a cyclic basis. Um, we have Barbados, we have some states in the US that prescribe that if you don't turn out to vote for two consecutive elections, then the commission ought to ask you a question. Are you alive? Are you living in the place? Are you available to vote? And when we did that, that, that study, when we did that research that worked last year, we had a recommendation which we put before the commission. Now read the recommendation. It says, an amendment is made either to the existing regulation, if possible, or to the parent relevant laws that persons who do not present themselves to vote in two consecutive general elections over five years period not less than f over a period not less than five years shall be removed from the list of eligible voters and we had a mechanism it's not just take you out the electoral commission having examined the data on the past two consecutive general election shall write to every registered voter at their registered address you registered at Ochobando in saint joseph we write to you at Ochobando in saint joseph requesting that the voter confirms that he still resides at the registered address. The onus would be on that registered elector to respond to electoral commission stating either that it's still, he or she still resides in the registered address or indicating it has moved to either another polling district or out of state and the time since it has done so. If the registered elector does not respond, the electoral office shall then remove the name from the list of registered voters. Now, if that is done, there are several benefits to that. First of all, this amendment would nullify that vexing provision of having to verify that non-resident registered Dominicans have returned to the state within the last five years, and therefore still eligible to remain on the electors list and to vote. But it also effectively deals with dead persons. A dead man cannot respond. But also it deals with persons who are commonwealth citizens who are no longer resident in Dominica. A commonwealth citizen after living in Dominica for 12 months can register to vote and can vote. But only if you're resident in Dominica. If you're no more resident in Dominica, you cannot respond and say, I still live in Ochobando. 
It is a very cost-effective way to continuously revise and sanitize the list. After every election, the electoral commission, the electoral office can sanitize the list like that. And we have a precedent, the Dominica Social Security Pension Scheme. We know rights to every pensioner, every year, say, please identify yourself. Are you alive? And you have to go to a notary republic or justice of peace if you're not in Dominica to do so and to send a letter. So we can manage that, that footer um, registration and verification identification process. And it has to be a part of the electoral reform process. It has to be credible. It has to make sense. But let's go back to electoral commission because the administration administrative part of the reform have to be in place too. The electoral commission, the electoral office, and the constituency boundaries commission all have to be part of it. Um, we said in, in December 2019, before the election, that credible electoral reform should enhance the constitutional provision respecting the composition, financing, independence, and powers of the electoral commission. We know, all of us know, that in recent years and recent electoral cycles, there have been significant public concern and even accusation that members of the Electoral Commission have been functioning based on party dictates rather than national interests. The current commission is two members of the opposition um, party who is governed by the opposition leader and two members from the party forming the government side and one member nominated by the president. I will not go as far as saying whether or not the president is neutral, but let's assume it's neutral. You already have a division. It is recommended that the membership to the commission should not be limited to only two political parties and a nominee of the president. We recommend, of course, that no more than one commissioner should come from any one political party. One political party should not have so much influence over the electoral process. So whether it is the party forming the government or the party of the opposition, only one commissioner should come from that. And that civil society, church and business sectors should have representation. And therefore we recommend that possibly the commission could have nine, seven persons, one member from the governing side, one member from the party forming the leader of the opposition, the, the party who the leader of the opposition is, is, is a member. One member jointly recommended by the remaining political parties. The other remaining political parties, supposedly all opposit opposition parties, they should be able to come together and nominate one so that the president can, can have on, on that commission. And one member jointly recommended by trade unions, one member jointly represented by the the, the business, the Dominica Business Forum, who is the umbrella body for the business community. One member jointly recommended by the churches, the Dominica Christian Council and Dominica Association of Evangelical Churches. And one member recommended by identified civil society organization or professional bodies. And we also say that the president should appoint a chairperson from among those nominees, not a separate person. And if the persons who are supposed to bring forth a nominee, uh, let's say the trade unions don't bring in, the president would be at liberty to appoint somebody if a nominee is not presented to him in the prescribed time. But we also want to look at reform that has to do, um, but before I go to that, um, yes, reform that has to do with the independence of the electoral commission. And we recommended in April 2019 that the amendment is made either to the existing regulation, if possible, or to the parent laws to enable the financial independence of the electoral reform and the electoral office from the executive branch of government. This amendment can cause the office of the chief elections officer to be at the level of a permanent secretary as an accounting officer giving the electoral office its own budget to be approved by parliament along with and independently of the executive branch of government. The justification of, of course, all of us know that the justification will be true independence of electoral reform so that no prime minister, no executive branch can say, or minister of finance can say, we can't give you the money. 
we need the money to fix roads. Um, is there an issue? Um, I would say, Tony, maybe that might be a, a good space for you to take a breather. Yes. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot more because I listened to your presentation to the um, forum and I know there's a lot more that you have and we'll give you yes. another chance to come yep. back and give you some more time to present the rest of it. But I think mm -hmm. you've touched on so many areas that are so important. I, I really don't want us to forget them. And I'm pretty sure that our listeners are listening intentively. And I know that they will have questions about some of those and they will have their own suggestions. But I do know that um, Dr. Dion George has been speaking about some of those things. He has been speaking about campaign finance reform. He has been speaking about the structure and the independence of the Electoral Commission. He has been speaking about the question of residency, which you yourself have remarked on. He has some distinctive ideas about the question of residency. And all this, what you said about the ID, I mean, in terms of getting registered, I mean, it's so important. And then, of course, this case study that you looked at, if somebody has not voted for two election cycles, can you be sure that they're still around? That they still reside in the same place? Can we be certain? So I think it's a good idea by, by way of creating that place to do what the social security is doing. There's precedence there. You're quite right. I know social security sends stuff to people every month, every year, do this to cleanse their list, right? So I agree with this. I want to go over to Dr. Dion George. Dr. George, um, you, you have been talking about these things for quite some time, and I, I really agree. Tonight, let us hear your views. Though we're doing this against the background that we have had, in fact, this forum with um, the business forum with with, with Dr. with um, Sir Byron and the electoral and members of the electoral commission. We heard some of what was presented there by different people. We heard the remarks of Sir Byron himself. We heard the remarks of the chairman, Sir Duncan, so and some of the other members of the commission. Look at it in that context, because what we're doing here, we hope, is not going to spot deaf ears, that it will add to all of the substance that's already been given in all the reports that are there. I hope they're not piling dust on some self somewhere. I hope somebody's looking at them actively. All these recommendations that Mr. Libla said that have been there, they have been made for many, many years. The question is implementation. Who has the will to implement? And that will must not depend on somebody wanting to preserve an election legacy by giving foreign dominance or dominance to people who are outside to come to vote, dominate the will of the people who are resident in Dominica. Yeah. We come to the question of residency. Dr. George, let me go over to you now to give us some of your wisdom on some of those issues. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gregoire. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity because I think this is a very salient discussion that we are having and notwithstanding why we are having that. Interestingly, uh, we are doing that because we want a better Dominica. We want a better Dominica for ourselves and for our children. And of course, whenever we have these discussions, we have to be thankful to God and to the Holy Spirit who we invite, of course, in this discussion. And so, uh, good evening to my uh, panelists and to the listening public. And um, thank you, Mr. Greg, again. And so the question of electoral reform, I think uh, Mr. Leblanc touched on a array of subjects very comprehensive and um, of course uh, justice andre uh, very uh, poetic but very direct uh, dealt with some issues and so i won't spend too much time on what they have already touched on because i'm hearing from some of my uh, colleagues and friends in dominica and they are saying essentially that uh, dr george uh, are you aware that the incumbent government knows what the recommendations from the international organizations and regional organizations, they know what they are. And uh, according to some of our previous speakers, the bottom line here is implementation of those programs. And so to be quite frank, there are those who assume that our efforts here may be falling on deaf ears. But I am one who is a strong advocate for education and for speaking out publicly because uh, my studies have uh, journeyed me through understanding how government works. And I have spoke of 
uh, if it does not work through a bureaucratic process, or if it does not work through uh, uh, what they call um, an elitist process or a, even a pluralist process, i.e. that different sectors contribute to decision making, then what often happens is that it ends up in what is called a social movement theory process. And what that means in direct terms is that you will see protests, you will see demonstrations, you will see in our colloquial language blocking streets. But we do not want that. And what we want is a functioning government, as I said, for ourselves and for our children. Uh, historically, uh, people tend to put a negative connotation to the word politics. And that often happens because people tend to identify politics with individuals. But I will venture to submit to you that uh, politics is more than just an individual, that politics also includes institutions. And part of the institutions would include things like campaign finance reform. And to the listening public, what that means by definition is that it is the efforts uh, to change the rules of how political campaigns can be paid for with the aim to making elections fairer for all parties who have been registered to compete in that election. Typically in, in, in democracies, the public in most democracies support campaign finance reform. And what that means in essence often is uh, it puts a cap on the amount of spending by special interest groups. And so, for example, in the United States, it might be the uh, tobacco companies who could pay a political party large sums of monies and could influence the results of the election. Specifically in Dominica, what that would mean is it might be an individual who supports a particular party, or it might be a public entity or a private entity, in fact, uh, who donates large sums of monies to that political party. And what tends to happen is that this uh, entity or individual tend to have uh, a lot of influence in how things are managed, decision making uh, in that country. To put in other words, what typically happens is those entities who submit large sums of monies to governments tend to literally buy the government. Uh, to put in other words, have major influence as to what happens. And what that would mean is they decide who get contracts, who they hire, uh, who they decide to contract with them, etc. Ultimately, what that means is an outside entity is contributing to a political party that can influence the results of the election and have more say and even the locals and the people of that country. And so the purpose behind campaign finance reform, in a nutshell, is to remove big money in politics and to create an environment where elections are decided by the people and not by outside entities. And there are a lot of folks who might say, okay, well, how would that work? Uh, have Dominica been exposed to that before? Are there successful models? Are there other, other Caribbean countries who have attempted it? And the answer is yes. And of course, Dr. Irvin Andre mentioned the fact that Antigua and other countries have looked at certain sort of electoral uh, reform. But Jamaica, I think, has a, a working model. And, and what they have done is that they have established, uh, Mr. Gregor, something called a National uh, Election Campaign Fund. And that is a fund that has several purposes. Uh, one of the main purpose, of course, is to accept and receive contributions from individuals and, and, and companies and even entities, in Dominica case, perhaps from folks from the diaspora uh, uh, to help individuals who are campaigning for the election and parties. Another one is to um, help uh, promote participation in government from the public and from other interest groups. But one of the things that Jamaica is very proud of is that they have uh, noted that uh, it has heightened local and regional and even international confidence 
in their elections, and it has reduced the perception of corruption and, and corruption in their election and on how they spend their campaign expenditure, i.e. how do they spend money during a campaign. And you well know that, and the Dominican public is well aware, that there have been several accusations about bringing in uh, guests and bribery and paying for shows. And so all of these things can be taken care of in the context of campaign finance reform. Uh, interestingly, Dominica, uh, I will confess, has dropped three points on the corruption index uh, in 2012. That's the last data I had. We ranked uh, 48 of 180 countries with a score of 55 out of 100. And so I'm saying that simply to say that if we can improve our election processes, and if we can make our elections uh, seemingly uh, fairer, uh, perhaps that can help in our international image on the level of corruption. Specifically, however, as to how this campaign finance uh, national election fund would work, uh, I'll mention a couple of things. One of the things that Jamaica did, I think I can share, is they talked about defining some terms very clearly. Uh, notably, they define terms like campaign, uh, campaign period. They define terms as to contribution. And again, one might say, so what is important about that? How trivial is that? Is? Well, essentially it's not, because what we have had in Dominica is persons would give uh, members of a political party monies, and they would argue that this is a gift, or this is from a friend and really and truly it's campaign contribution and so what you want to do is clearly define what is a donation what is the contributor etc uh, another thing that uh, the jamaicans did which i think we can consider in our elections is to uh, consider who persons receive monies from in fact there are laws that uh, would prescribe penalties for folks who would receive financing uh, from persons who are perhaps dubious or suspected of raising illicit monies. And if that were to be found true, that they would be punishable uh, in the magistrate court. And so these laws exist and there are penalties associated with them. And unless Dominica do not get to that point, we will keep on having these discussions over and over and nothing will happen. And that's what some folks are starting to suggest. But with the advent of our friend, uh, Sir Dennis Byron, and with the amount of monies of Dominica's taxpayers' money, which is being invested into his report, I think it, it comes to bear that we, the Dominican public, are expecting that some of the recommendations uh, would reflect in his report. Now, on that note, I would say, I hope that the report that uh, the hired uh, advisor, I would refer to him, uh, does not outweigh the independent electoral commission to which the Constitution of Dominica has instituted. And indeed, that the consultations that are being held would also reflect uh, the recommendations as well, i.e. the recommendations would be a people's recommendation with the ele independent electoral commission and with also NGOs, etc. On that note, I would suggest uh, that we not only have campaign finance reform, but as some of my previous colleagues on this panel mentioned, that Dominica has come to the stage that after being independent from the British, a system that we inherited that we did not create for ourselves, that we can fix our country, we can fix the way we work together as a people. And so we would need what is called constitutional reform. To that point, I suggest that we have fixed elections day. Of course, perhaps I'm echoing, echoing something that has been mentioned already, but in this day and age, I think it's ridiculous that one person can say, hey, boy, be careful, I call election tomorrow, you know. And then election is called in a month. Long story short, it's very unfair. And we want, as a people, after one 
party or one person has passed away or moved on, that we leave something that our children can inherit, something that we know that is an institution that is functional. And so I suggest that we have fixed election date. Even the independent electoral uh, commission should be able to disperse the funds from the national campaign fund. In fact, we would have something which is called a campaign period, let's say three months before the election, knowing when is the election date as well. And so then it's election time and persons get their fund from the national campaign fund and it's a level playing field. And if you're so confident in your work and you're so confident in your track record, you should not be afraid to have a fair fight. And so with that being said, uh, it brings me to the composition of the, what I would suggest, independent electoral commission. Of course, in the consultation we had on Thursday with Sir Dennis Byron, uh, who seemingly seemed to be very receptive, um, uh, I suggested diluting the effect of a dominant incumbency or a dominant party. Because the current situation, as noted earlier, is that there are two members from the two dominant parties, and of course there is a chair. And what has happened, as we all know, it has left us in a stalemate. And so it's not functional. And so my recommendation was to dilute the effect of a dominant party. And so my suggestion was to include perhaps one member from the legal fraternity perhaps one member from the um, from the uh, religious fraternity, perhaps one member from an NGO, i.e. the economic engine of the country. And, um, and so I, I, I suggested like four persons outside of the politicians themselves. It doesn't have to be that prescribed. It could be seven, but the point and the, and the ethos here is that we dilute the effect of a dominant party. On that note, I also want to mention something about the presidency. I think it's high time that, you know, people talk about, well, I don't know if the president is neutral, he's supposed to be a ceremonial position, etc. Well, there's a way to deal with that. And the way to deal with that, I would suggest that there's a school of thought that says that parliamentary democracies like Dominica ought to consider making even the office of the presidency have term limits, term limits that after an election, perhaps the winning party can appoint their own president instead of having some president lingering there. That's just a school of thought. It doesn't have to be. In, in fact, there's another school of thought that suggests that we could do like the U.S. and elect the president the same way we elect the prime minister. You know, but critics to that view would confess that perhaps that's too expensive to have another election for the presidency. But I'm throwing these ideas out there as considerations that can be considered in how we move forward instead of having this stalemate that is very unfair to what is currently going on. The next thing I would like to touch on is that the opposition, whoever they are, have a play and a right also in this process of electoral reform. One of the things that they can do is to work as an intelligentsia agency with foreign government to, uh, to perhaps report suspected persons who are voting illegally. And of course, uh, talking about voting illegally, that brings me to a point that was mentioned earlier but of course, I think it's really, really important that we deal with that because when the CARICOM report gave its recommendation, they spoke specifically about voting by the diaspora. And if I may, if you can allow me briefly, uh, some of the recommendations says that all electors coming from the diaspora to vote should be asked to provide a valid passport as identification in order to exercise his or her franchise. It went on to say that the joint mission recommends that urgent and inclusive consultation to be conducted on the process of the overseas verification of 
electors in order to settle and inform the commission's actions in this regard. But of course, uh, uh, we in the Dominican public uh, listening to QFM uh, knows that the uh, Registration of Election Act, Section 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, on page 26 of the Constitution of Dominica speaks very specifically about the issue of residency. Indeed, it says that, and if I may quote section four, that no person shall, for the purpose of the act, be deemed to be ordinarily resident in any polling district to which he has come for the purpose of engaging in temporary employment. And so what that simply means, say for example, someone is dating someone from the village of Mayor or St. Joseph, and they sleep there, and everybody in St. Joe may know them, but then they have to move back to Salisbury. But you, you cannot vote in St. Joseph and still vote in Salisbury. It, it clearly says in the Constitution, if you work somewhere temporarily, that's not your resident. Now, let's make that applicable to what is really happening in Dominica. If someone works in Atlanta, Georgia, or New York City, and you work over there, you stay over there, you live over there, you have an ID, you're a resident, you get benefits from the government, and you can come... How can you come back and vote in your in your village in Dominica? That totally disregards the issue of residency. And so the recommendation here is this, that this issue of if you're in the country uh, within five years, that is not a prescription for residency. And so one of the recommendations, therefore, should be to remove that. And clearly, and the Electoral Commission can be charged with that, clearly, define what is residency. That is somewhere that you live, somewhere that you stay, and if you go, you intend to come back within a certain fight prescribed time. The last point I will touch on before I, I, I pass on to my next colleague is the issue of this survey. And this survey, of course, has been criticized by a lot of people, and there are some people who say, oh, it's a good survey, you know, COVID virus, so they have to do it online. But I will say this, data drives policy. And that is true for business, that is true for government. That data drives policy, but the data has to be correct. Imagine that this data that persons can retake infinity on and on and on, that this data has no frame population what we could find out happening is that we can get a result, and listen to me carefully, that out of 70,000 people of Dominica, 5 million people have responded that Dominica need election reform. You hear what I'm saying? Out of 70,000 people, 10 million people have said that we need voters' ID. This is ridiculous. In other words, the response cannot fit the Dominican population. I mean, I don't want to advise what they should do with the survey. Maybe right now at this point, they could perhaps suggest that this is what the general public, including the rest of the world, thinks about electoral reform in Dominica. And then they can write an article about it because that's what the data would show, what the rest of the world thinks. But to carry out a survey that does not have a control frame in political science, the application is there is no generality. You cannot use it to generalize the Dominican public. And so the humble recommendation is do not use it for any sort of indication as to what the Dominican people thinks. Mr. Gregor, thank you so much. And I can send it to my next presenter. Yes, and, and as usual, thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Dr. George. Um, as I go over to um, former Ambassador Christine Gregoire, who's in studio in Dominica. Uh, I have to reflect on the, on the emphasis you place on the question of residency, and of course, and the independence of the Electoral Commission, which already was established by Anthony Liebler and, um, and, Dr., and Dr. Andre. Everybody seems to think that the, in, the uh, Electoral Commission should be independent as it could be more reflective of society, that there should be no domination of the political parties who in fact were parties who have to be subject to it. 
You cannot make the rules for your own game. You cannot do that. So they should not be the ones influencing, having the highest influence on the electoral commission. I take the point as well, and I'm pretty sure we all do, the role of big money. And the electoral commission should have this fund that they control their own budget. They should not have to wait on a finance minister to tell them, okay, we haven't got money now, so you can't get the ID cards this week. Or you have to wait because we have to do... No, they should have their own budget. They should get their money and have it in their account and do their business without any influence or interference from the political directorate. That should be very clear. This is what independence means, right? And then, of course, um, the whole question of, of, of really ensuring that the chairman is not a political appointment, I think that what is wrong? If we have confidence in our people, for God's sake, we send our people to go and study, they get PhDs and maths, all kind of things, and they come back, they're professionals, lawyers, and so on. Why can if there are seven of them or nine of them there, why can't they all elect the chairman from among them their numbers? Somebody who they think is competent and then ask the president to, to appoint that person as their chairman. Why should the president be the one deciding? I think the people don't we have to have confidence in our people and their professionalism and their experience. So these are some of the things that I would take away from what we told you, what Dion and um, and um, and Tony have said, and Dr. Andre, so far. And then I go over to um, Ambassador Greg. Well, and, and on, on that, um, and Dr. George, on that question of the survey, I mean, there is a recommendation that you can make. One of them would be to put it in file number 13, which is, you know, <laughs> the bin. Because frankly, if you're going to tell me, Dr. George, that is an open-ended thing. We have about maybe 60 to 70,000 people in Namlika. Not all of them vote. Maybe about 50,000 are eligible to vote or less. If that is what we have, why can we, how can we have a survey that would allow 100,000 people or more to vote? It cannot be just open-ended. So anytime you, you, it's open-ended, it cannot be, cannot be real. I mean, the data, no business person, no manager, should really use that kind of data to make these decisions. And so Mr. Gregor, if I may just uh, interject a little bit as well, I, I think it's fair that I would say that on behalf of the Dominican public. I mean, we have to consider that not everybody in Dominica has a computer. Not everybody in Dominica has the internet. And I think it's very unfair to the people perhaps in the country or perhaps do not own a computer or internet who are part of the Dominican public to not be part of the response of that survey. And so simply put, the result is skewed on so many levels. It leaves out the entire sector of the Dominican public. I just thought I would have mentioned that. So I think you're reinforcing my point about maybe putting it in file 13. So <laughs> let me go over to Ambassador, former Ambassador Crispin Gregoire. Um, Ambassador Gregoire, you, I know there are a number of things that you yourself presented to the Electoral Commission. I'm sure you'll want to reinforce those things and to maybe to introduce some things that you really did not have to, time to introduce there because I've heard you on many platforms, especially on our shows here. I know that you will want to go back to the context of the 19, 2019 election and see what happened there or even before that to see where electoral reform comes into play there. And um, you, you, I'm sure you'll want to Maybe look a little bit at the whole question of, of Sir Byron's appointment. I noticed that our esteemed Justice of Andre did make some references to, to Sparrow's Calypso. I'll be there. But you yourself may have your own suggestions, your own thoughts as to how that came into being. And of course, I know that you've talked before about the recommendations of the OES. And I believe you've already told us some time ago the OES probably would have been prepared to provide the expertise and to pay for it to do the reforms that we're talking about there. So you, you ask the question, why would we spend $500,000 to do that when the OS might have paid for it? And in fact, we could have used 300,000 of that to do the voter ID cards. So these are some of the things I imagine. And then of course, the, the multi-stakeholder framework for the commission. So let me leave it up to you, Ambassador Gregoire, to deal with some of those issues. Let me go over to you now. Your, your mic is, is closed on the computer next to you, so 
So you have, now you have to open the mic on your computer there. All right. You open the mic for him. So we'll give you a minute for, for Lambi to open up to unmute your mic. The mic on the PC on the it needs to be unmuted. Is that better? Uh, no, no, we can hear your powerful voice loud and clear. Okay. Um, let me say good evening to Dominicans at home and abroad. And also, I, I like to salute the non-Dominicans who are listening to Global View every week. Um, let me say good evening to my friends and people in South City, Grand Bay, and the Carinago Territory. I, Sharon, I wanted to, to say that, um, start off by saying that electoral reform, in my view, is the only strategy to bring back a level playing field in electoral politics, fairness, and and what what has happened to our country is that because of three cycles of on what I call unfair electoral cycles, we now have a problem in that we, we don't have a national consensus. It used to be that after an election in Dominica, if you go back to the 80s and the 90s, um, an election is held, um, people compete very, um, very um, closely and uh, they do, they work for the parties. And then when the election comes, the, the one party wins and the one that loses accepts the result. And, that is what is lacking in Dominica today, that from 2009 to now, um, the, the opposition supporters, they don't embrace the results of the election because they feel that it's not a fair result. And, and successive elections, so we, we have 2009, 2014, then 2019, three election cycles, in what a majority of Dominicans feel is not a fair process. Now, it doesn't matter to me who wins in, in, in elections. What matters to me is how did they win? Did they win? Was it fair? Did they steal the election? Did they have dead people voting? I mean, the question is, was it a fair process? I would say that the election before 2009 was embraced by the people and they accepted the result. Whether the party won or lost, they accepted that. We cannot say that is the reality in Dominica since 2009. And that is the problem. My worry is this. See, some these kind of problems will eventually catch up with our country. My big fear is that it can lead to a civil crisis. Because we've not had free and fair elections, there are people who will grieve. And at some point, if they don't see a free and fair election, they're just going to take things into their own hands. And that could lead to violence. That could lead to civil conflict. And I've been to many countries where there have been civil conflict. I certainly wouldn't want civil conflict to come to our shores. But if we don't take steps to prevent that, we are going to arrive there. We're going to arrive at the doorstep of a civil conflict because we have not free and fair elections. I, I wanted to start off by looking at the big picture, and that is many things have happened. And Sheridan, I will speak about the 2019 election. But what I wanted to say is that for us to, to be sane about fairness and, and free and fair elections in Dominica, which has eluded, eluded us for the last three cycles. I want to go back to the charter, the Inter-American Democracy Charter of the Organization of American States. And I just want to read a little bit from the first paragraph, which says, um, considering that the Charter of the um, American, Organization of American States recognizes 
that representative democracy is indispensable for the stability, peace, and development of the region. And that one of the purposes of the OAS is to promote and consolidate representative democracy with due respect for the principle of non-intervention. I like that last part about the principle of non-intervention because what we had at the 2019 election, we had intervention by foreign forces in our election. That is, that is totally unacceptable. And I, I, I look forward for the day when we will take, we'll file a complaint against the regional security service before the, in, the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. I believe that's where we have to go with that issue. It's not a closed issue yet. I also want to say, you know, just to, to frame what is electoral reform, because sometimes people say, we don't need electoral reform. Well, for me, electoral reform is simply a change in the electoral system to improve how the public desires that are expressed in election results. That's what electoral reform is all about. When, uh, when the system for electing a government is broken, as it is in Dominica, um, we, have to, we have to have a reform. I mean, can you imagine that Dominica is the only country in the CARICOM where, where that does not require a voter ID card to vote? So you can just show up and say, I am Tom Brown, and Tom Brown's list is, uh, name is on that list, and, and you vote as Tom Brown. I, I, know, I know people in the 2019 election who voted on dead people's names because there are 20,000 dead people on our list. I, you know, these are the kind of glaring kind of problems that we have. Um, and, uh, and then you add to that incumbency for 20 years. How can an opposition party ever win with this kind of broken electoral governing system that we have in Dominica? Now, I think it's, it's, it's timely that... Um, after the 2019 election, we're now looking back, it's now 40 years, we're independent, 42 years, and the system is broken. Our electoral governance system is broken, so we have to fix it. And that is why I have said in very um, clear terms that what is needed in Dominica is a multi-party consultation at which no party has any advantage, not the ruling party. Every party goes into that multi-stakeholder -stake consultation having no advantage because we're talking about building an electoral system for the next 50 years. So it, it better, we better get it right now. And I'm saying to you, there are a lot of things that are broken in the Dominica electoral system. The, the, the Inter-American Democratic Charter, it says something that I would like to highlight, and the Article 3 of that, of that um, Inter-American Democratic Charter says, the essential elements of representative democracy include, number one, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. And those fundamental freedoms are actually outlined in our Constitution, in the first part of our Constitution. Access to the exercise of power in accordance with the rule of law. Do we have that here? I, we have some of it, but I don't think it's totally in that realm. The holding of periodic free and fair elections based on secret balloting and universal suffrage as an expression of the sovereignty of the people. The, plural, the pluralistic system of political parties and organizations, so a system our system is one that allows for political parties and independents to participate. And then to have civil society organizations active in that process. And, and finally, the separation of powers and the and independence of the institutions like the, inter, the Electoral Commission. I, I want to say one more thing about Article 4 of that that charter. It says that transparent, transparency in government activities, probity, responsible public administration on the part of the government, respect 
for social rights, freedom of expression and of the press, and other essential co components of democracy. Those things are critical in, in, in building an, an, a, a, a responsible electoral governance system. That's what we're talking about, electoral reform. It's the governance system for elections we're talking about. So when I think of, you know, all of these problems that we have as far as electoral governance goes, the 2019 elections is a good, a good case study. And I hope that some bright student studying political science will write about that. There's a lot to write. The 2019 elections, um, in the lead up to it, the electoral reform agenda was, was clearly on the table. And, and what was interesting about this is that for the first time, it, it moved, the whole process moved away from the, the domination of the political parties to civil society. So we had the Concerned Citizens Movement, we had the, the, the civil society organizations that pronounced on electoral reform, and, 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 and my, my, my friend here, Mr. LeBlanc, was very much part of that. Uh, so we, we thought that electoral reform could possibly happen, even though time was running out on us. And by the time we get to 2018, we only have, we were thinking of that there's two more years before the next election. Of course, we had an, an early election. It was called in December of 2019. And um, while the, the, the forces that wanted a more transparent and, and, and equitable process, one that would be a free and fair process, a level playing field in place, meaning that electoral reform would have to be done, I didn't see the political will on the part of the Labour Party for doing that. And, 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 and when I surmised that that was the case, some people attacked me and said, you know, the, he, he's saying things that he shouldn't be saying. But I knew, I knew that the election, what, what was coming was a process that would not be free and fair. And, and you know, that, that, that situation reached the Organization of American States. I, I, both the Concerned Citizens Movement and the, the, the um, United Workers Party did make um, representation to the OS, to um, the State Department, to Congress. Um, the UWP was very active in that realm. And, you know, they, they understand the importance of getting their message into the international arena. And, and the best place would be in Washington. And they did that. So I, I, I've seen reports where the concerned citizens' um, activities in Dominica was reported in the pro-democracy organizations in the U.S. In, the, in, in their publications. So it meant that Dominica was under scrutiny because Dominica has not been implementing the recommendations of the observer missions. If they, I remember the Secretary General, when, when he um, made some pronouncement about the um, election process in Dominica and that I, in particular, my... I did go visit the, the Secretary General on, on, on free and fair elections in Dominica, and um, he received me, and, um, and the backlash that happened after that, um, he sent out a tweet with my picture and, uh, and him and, and, and me asking for help so that we can have a free and fair process in Dominica. I knew then, and that we're talking about, February of 2019, I knew then that there was no political will to have a free and fair election in Dominica. And if there was, if it would happen, it would, it would be violent. And it almost led to that. You remember Negmao Square being, you know, the, the, the citadel of, of, of democratic, democratic aspiration. And, and um, people were, were protesting in the streets. Um, the government decided that even though they had invited the OAS and the Commonwealth and the CARICOM in, 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 in unison, that they, um, they made a great recommendation in the time frame. It wasn't for comprehensive electoral reform. It was for limited electoral reform. And the government still did not support it, or the ruling party, the Dominican Labour Party. 
did not support it. And, and they said it would be too, too costly and too chaotic to implement. But they had taken, they had let the whole five years go on and they did nothing. And here we are again, after this election, they have done something which baffles me because um, as much as I have some respect for um, Sir Dennis Byron as an international jurist, he served on the, one of the UN tribunals. Um, I believe that the way that he was recruited is actually not legal. It is not the prime minister who, who decides on picking people to deal with electoral issues. No. In fact, the separation of powers would not allow him to do that. It is the Electoral Commission under the Constitution that is the only one that has the authority to engage people to be involved in any aspect of electoral governance. And in the separation of powers of our Constitution, the Prime Minister would have no business to deal with that. That is for the preserve of the Electoral Commission. The fact that he would, he would be the one to contract there's nothing, it's not illegal for the prime minister to contract this guy. The thing is that that is a responsibility for the commission, not for him. The only role he has to play is to make the finance available to the electoral commission when they ask for it. Not to be deciding how much to pay Mr. Byron and that kind of thing. Leave that to the commission. You are jumping the gun, sir. So that is what we're saying. We're saying that the commission must be independent, and I, and I love it when um, Professor George here said um, that what is one of the fundamental changes that we have to achieve with this electoral reform is the change in the electoral commission. I believe, and I'll say that tonight, that the electoral commission, we must remove the voting rights from the politicians on the commission. And what we want, and what I think civil society would want in Dominica is for us to add civil society people to the commission, like Pierre Charles did with the Integrity Commission. But they remove that. They remove civil society from the Integrity Commission. I am saying that on the um, Electoral Commission, we must have civil society representation. And until we have that, we will have the log jam that is the hallmark of the um, Electoral Commission. So I wanted to, just quickly, I know I have a time constraint, but I wanted to focus on the OAS recommendations. And I, for those of you who want to read the details, please go and read. Just Google the 2019 final report of the OAS on the Dominica elections and read it. And in that report, it's a 65-page report, but it, it's every single word in it is important. It, it focuses on, in the early part of the report, on, on the recommendations. And it makes about um, a number, about eight, eight recommendations. I'll just go through them very quickly, not in detail, but to mention to you, because I want you to go and read it for yourself. And that is, they highlighted electoral organization as one category that needs to be addressed. And under that, the most important thing they highlight is the voter ID card, that Dominica being the only island in, in, in the CARICOM, only country in the CARICOM that does not require a voter ID card. Then they talked about electoral technology that needs to be upgraded. Um, one of the things is that the, at, the, at the constituency level, the constituency, after they've counted the votes, they can't declare the winner. They have to wait for Roseau to declare the winner. And it's a technology challenge here. We should have a an upgrading technology that will allow at the constituency level for the decision to be made who the winner is and not wait for the central command in Roseau to decide that. Another area is, has to do with electoral registries. That's how it, and, and it's, it's, they're calling for, under that, an amending of the Registration of Electors Act to provide for a full enumeration exercise 
to be conducted to replace the voters list that's in existence today and thereafter allow for periodic verification of the voters list. I think that's a great approach to that problem. Let, it's not, we don't do the voters list one time. It's a continuous process, but let us get it clean now. Right now we have about 20,000 dead people on that voters list. We have a voters list that has more people on it than the total population. Um, those things have to change. I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's laughable that I can tell people abroad that my country um, doesn't require a voter ID card. Um, that uh, uh, the voters list, the voters list um, has many people in the diaspora who are not eligible to vote. They've been out for five years already. They should not be on the list. So it's time that we sanitize that list. And, and I'm saying that the only way to do that is not to take the list as it is and try to fix it. Let us do a total renumeration enumeration exercise. Everybody will be registered. And those who are not supposed to be registered will not be on the list. That's the problem we have. So we have, we have people voting on the dead people's name that's on the list. And, and that, that number, the OAS is saying, is about 20,000. Um, that is the, that is. So, so Christina, um, I don't know whether you can just, just try to rush through the next yeah. couple of them. So uh, right. we really want to take but a few abroad, hours, abroad, more lists, you know? Voting abroad meaning diaspora voters, the political participation of women. Um, we've done a little better as far as, as women in politics, but we still have a long way to go. Um, we have, I, I believe the last, in the last election, we had 13, 13 women contest. Eight of them were elected. In, um, well, uh, let, let me backtrack. Uh, six women were, were um, on the list in 2014 and 13 in 2019. They participated. Um, in 2014, we had eight women elected. And I believe we had a similar number of women elected in, in 2019. Um, I can take that list, but so the participation of women is, is something to be looked at. We like to see more women in politics, and and because politics can be a rough and tumble endeavor, many women don't want to be in it because it's not. It, you have to have a lot of backbone to take the, the pressure. Then political finance. The OAS recommends the introduction of legislation to regulate political party and campaign financing, including clear limits on campaign spending, the identification of the sources of the funding that you're getting, the parties are getting, the prevention of any anonymous donations, and the limitation um, to, to limit private and in-kind donations to the political process. So political finance, electoral justice is another area that is um, pursuing comprehensive reform of the voters list and identification of electors in order to reduce the number of objections. Um, and, and, and the fifth category is the electoral commission re reform, which is the composition of the electoral reform, um, the electoral commission and the breaking of what I call the logjam. The, the, the fact is that the still meet between the opposition our representatives and the government representatives, and even the chairman who is supposed to be independent, tends to vote with the 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 the, the labor the labor um, members. So basically, what you have is a three two situation: three members who support the the ruling party because the chairman is joining with them, and and then the opposition has two. So that that makes it it's a stalemate here. I I just. No, recognizing that I have time limitations, I just want to say that. Well, recognizing that you you kind of bought the time. <laughs> I know, um, but but I just want to say one more thing, Sheridan, is that, and that is, if we don't achieve electoral reform, and I I I I, I I've been kind to Sir Dennis Byron. I, I I think we should give him a, we should give him the benefit of the doubt that he can facilitate the process. Um, we are still trying to understand how he's facilitating that process. Um, I believe nothing short of a multi-party conference where we all sit down and we, we, we have a clear agenda and we, we work towards 
a conclusion by the end of this year of this process, because I wouldn't want us to be in 20, 20, um, 2022 still trying to do electoral reform. And um, next thing we know, before we know it, the election is, is here in 2024. So let us get to work. Thank you. Uh, as usual, former Ambassador Crispin Gregor, sound recommendation, sound presentation. You've covered the bases and particularly on all those recommendations from the OS. In fact, what in fact we seem to be saying from your reading of the recommendation of the OAS is that all of the things that we have, all of the parties have been recommending, in fact, have, have been consistent and true. And so if those recommendations do not find their way into the report of Sir Byron, I, I'm not sure that the people of Dominica would have confidence in that report, frankly. So I, I really want to go over to Lambi now because we did promise that we would take some calls from our listeners. So Lambi, could you give our listeners the numbers again and then invite them to call for a few minutes? We can take some calls and then just to ensure that you turn on your mic so, so that we can hear the callers when they call. And thanks a lot, Lambi. Go right ahead. We need to hear you. Numbers are 449-3095. 449-3096-449-3097-616-4257-305-432-9624. And we are taking the calls for the Global View on Q right now. Let me repeat, 449-3095-96-97-616-4257-305-432-9624. Four three two nine six two four, and we have a call on the line. Call on the line. Caller, please go ahead with your call. Yes, good evening. Hello. 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 Good evening. I just wanted to highlight one point, and that point is based on what I understood is that Mr. Byron was given by the Prime Minister point of reference as it relates to having the diaspora vote um, either overseas or have all people go overseas to register that. And that is a point based on this discussion tonight that is would be totally against our constitution and against our laws. Uh, I'd like you to address that in simple way. Thank you. Yes, that is a very good point. And I think um, Dion started covering that. I think, and, and Crispin mentioned it, I mean, uh, and also um, Anthony Leblanc, I mean, really, it's a bad idea to try to go overseas and look at clusters of people that you select that you want to register. It makes no sense. You're not going to get any universal registration that way. It's better to register everybody at home. Lambi, if you have any calls, you can take them. Otherwise, I'd really like to go over to Dr. Irving Andre. Because Dr. Andre, um, so much has come out already, and so much came out before, and so much came out at that conference that took place with the Business Forum and, and Sir Byron and the members of the Commission. I think what we really want to emphasize is that that report from Mr. Byron to the Commission should really, should really contain the recommendation that the people are making. It really should reflect the will of the people, not the, the, what was on a, a survey that anybody else could have come under but really should reflect the will of the people. Okay, Andrew, let me get some of your comments on that, please, if you can. But again, I mean, look at it from a logical perspective. We have had the benefit of reports from qualified people who've had accumulated vast experience in the field of electoral reform. They have given us a roadmap as to what true and genuine electoral reform involves. We know the parameters of true and genuine electoral reform. We know the components, campaign finance reform, clean up the electoral list, enforcing your laws, voters identification card. We know all these things. And the fundamental question is simple. After having three or four reports which reiterate these fundamental foundations of free and elector reform, what is the efficacy? What is the need? What is the significance of hiring someone, paying him more money than was required 
to clean the voters list or to get electoral identification cards, what is the significance of doing so? For one purpose, to produce a report which is skewed to reflect the wishes of the directorate. There's no ifs, ands about it. Benefit of doubt doesn't come in my respectful view, because if the government wanted to know what was electoral reform, then what more information did it need? What, what, what is it? You want a, to, a, a script to be handed down on tablets of stone from the hand of the father? No. The whole purpose, according to you, as your caller rightly identified, is to get an eminent jurist, someone with some status in the Caribbean, to produce a report which sanctifies the whole business of overseas reporters. And that is the beginning of the end, because you know and everybody knows, based on past, that those who will be selected to vote abroad, it will be done on a discriminatory basis. We know that as a fact. Recall what Rosie Douglas proposed. Rosie Douglas, who understood quite clearly that to give all persons with Dominican passports or Dominican citizenship residing of abroad the vote, it would dilute, it would render the local vote into outright significance because the number of votes abroad would vastly outnumber those of resident Dominicans on the ground, and that would be patently unfair. Hence his proposal that overseas voters can only vote for two representatives so that they would not skew the results of any election. All that has been jettisoned and dumped in the heap, the dump at Pocoli or wherever it is. So the folks are not interested in free and fair elections. So why do we have this little facade, this little masquerade that, oh, probably Lord Byron will do the right thing? Come on, I mean, let's grow up. We're all big adult folks. We know what's happening here. You know, the government is cherry picking to see if the right set of recommendations can be produced and thereby enacted into law. That is what this is all about. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a simple. That's how I see it. Um, so, Dr. Andre, I mean, this really goes back to the point we all been making right through. And I believe many other organizations in Dominica have been making that same point. If this report does not reflect the will of the people, which is what I think you're saying it will not, you're saying of because of the way the appointment took place, and the terms that are given, you think, and it's obvious that it is quite clear, that I do not think, if we go back to how this thing came about in the first place, based on that email, which says that these guys want to do genuine electoral reform, which will mess up your winning legacy. Any contract to anybody now to do something cannot result in that same thing, otherwise they will reject it again. And why pay how much money to just get something you're going to reject? So the, the fact of the matter is that this the directorate does not want any report with recommendations that is going to affect their winning legacy. And as the caller said, and you rightly pointed out, Dr. Andre, this overseas votes is where they see the winning legacy lies. And let me make a bold prediction. If this report from the senior jurist follows in the tradition of all the other reports which were dumped. This time, they will look for John the Baptist to write a report on electoral reform. It's as simple as that. Let's be honest, folks. Let's cut to the chase. That's what's happening here. They're cherry picking to get the right result to enact as being the re a reflection of the will of the Dominican people. That's all there is to it. Uh, no, not really, but we're just going to all come in now and just comment because I mean, I want to go over to you, but we can always just jump in at any time and comment now because we're not going to because the time is running out on us. Your, your further thoughts on this because what we're really con con conclusion is that it appears that the political directorate does not want any kind of report with recommendations 
along the lines that are being made by the OAS or some of these organizations. Some of the recommendations that you are making and I am making and Dr. Andre and Crispin Gregg were making, because it seems as if the political directory, the incumbent, are concerned and that will impact their winning legacy. So clearly, that is not what they're looking for, because they want to continue up a winning, winning legacy for many, many years. You're, you're full of thoughts. What should we do? I mean, should any kind of thing that is not looking like what might result in free and free, and free elections, any kind of legislation that should ever make its way to the parliament for consideration? Well, I, I certainly don't think so. Um, and on the question of the overseas voters and registration, we had the commission wanting to go out to the diaspora to register persons, but the commission did not have any list of who were there. The commission over the years have never compiled a list of where does Irvin Andre live? Where That's does right. Dion Andre live? So how is sorry, the commission- sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but my name is still on the list. And the last time I vote in Dominica is in the late seventies. Yes, but uh, the point is if they have to go and re-register you as they wanted to do, they, they had no list of whether you were in Toronto or Tumbuktu. Right. That is the issue. How can you go and verify? And we have said that if you want to res if you want to 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 um, vote, voting is residency tied. But if you want to tie it and you want to say that you want to vote, then you should be paying taxes as well. You should be contributing to the economy because you cannot want to decide who is the boss without paying the boss. You have to be able to do that. When I say the boss, I'm, I'm speaking about paying the country, not necessarily the prime minister or whoever. At the end of the day, as I started by saying that the, the issue is implementation. And we have had enough reports, we have had enough recommendations to be implemented. We did not need to reinvent the wheel. But here we have a new wheel is being drawn to be implemented. Um, we cannot afford to sit by and assume that the person designing the wheel is going to put all the requirements into it. It's going to be structurally strong to carry us. So we have to make sure that the ingredients needed for that wheel to be constructed are there. And it's our role to make sure that we remind the designer, remind the builder, that those are requirements that has to be in electoral reform. And we cannot go by and say after the report is, is given that you didn't put this without reminding them that this was required. So when the report is out, we have a role to play. We have to examine that report. Is it a report designed to suit the administration, or is it a report designed to suit the people? Is it repeating what was already said? And we have to take it from there. So I'm waiting for the report. Um, it, it, it is the business community is waiting for the report. Um, and we will continue to make intervention and continue to see these are what is required for electoral reform. You need to take this into consideration. And um, Dr. Dion George, I have noticed that what has been happening in Dominica is that um, whenever you have any sector or any subsector, any group that have difficulty, they take some sort of action on their own. Yeah. And then they seem to get some results. We remember the bus drivers. A group of bus drivers, not only bus drivers, they had serious problems. They took some action, they got some result. Just today, we heard about some, some heavy equipment operators, people who have big trucks, you know. And they noticed that there were things happening in their constituency. Foreigners were coming and getting all the job. They were not getting, they took some action. It seems as they got results. I want to just ask you, does that look like you talked about pluralism, but does, does that look like the alternative that might be available in the circumstances? Because we remember that there, there was an initial attempt to go to the parliament with a law that was going to legitimize bribery and treating. That was stopped. 
Do you think that it may come to the point where Dominicans no. have to wake up and recognize that that report, the recommendations in there, could possibly okay. tend to support the winning legacy, which is what I think the political directory, the comments are looking for. Should Dominicans prepare themselves to ensure that that legislation does not reach anywhere close to the parliament for consideration? Because it seems as if that is the only thing that this the directorate understands that the people make their presence felt and make their feelings known and so that they take action to ensure that the, the political directive get the message that they do not wish this legislation to go to parliament if it does not contain the recommendations that seem to be universally accepted that are good for presidential elections, like Jamaica, like St. Lucia, like Antigua, like St. Kitts, what the OAS is saying, and so on. Your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Mr. Gregoire, you have framed a question in such a conceptual way, but it's a direct question. And uh, it was James Madison, one of the founders of the U.S. Constitution, that said that if men were angels, there would not be a need to have a constitution. And it's because we are not angels. In other words, men make decisions and it can be corrupt. It can make mistakes. In other words, we are imperfect beings. And to your question, um, I have alluded to that several times. That is, decision-making should be by the people. And the examples that you use today with the truckers, with the bus drivers, and apparently the social movement theory seemed to have arrived in Dominica. Well, and, and the, the, the teachers and students at the college as well. Exactly. And I would hit that is how Dominica would have come, that for people to get results, they would have to take to the streets because there are other political scientists who have given other ways in which things can work, as in what we are trying to do here, to have discussions, to get recommendations, and to actually put in the regulations that would make a fair playing field. But as you perhaps in your question can foresee outside of that, uh, as history has shown, uh, people tend to um, act differently when they see their rights are being trampled upon. Nobody's asking for that. We are hoping that this electoral reform, this campaign finance reform, these things can come to attention. But give me one second. I know we are thinking for them, but uh, former Ambassador Crispin Gregor mentioned something I really want to touch on because it touched me. And he mentioned the idea that we should file, you know, lawsuits against the regional security. But, you know, my cousin got shot there, Mr. Schillingford, and some other friends of mine got tear gassed and so forth, you know. And I'm saying to myself, somebody has to invite them. And not everybody that cry wolf get, get help. The Salisbury farmers cry a lot of wolf. And, you know, I'm hearing that two days now, no water in Salisbury. So I don't know what is going on, but I don't think it's just the regional security. I think Salisbury people really need to deal with what has been affecting them for a long time. Even today, I listened to QFM that some people are still facing charges on the eve of an election, which means that Ambassador Greg Ray is right. On the eve of an election, you had forces firing live bullets. So, Mr. Greg, why no 10 doesn't permit? But your question is a very directed one. And I think the purpose for what we have in this conversation for uh, have utility. That is, we're trying to make things amicable, put things in law, put things in institutions that government can function properly. Thank you. But, but the question is, does it really mean, uh, or does it look like there's a pattern, Ambassador, Ambassador Gregoire? Does it look like there is a pattern now in terms of our governance system, our governance mechanism, that we don't get results unless the people take action? Because as I said, from those that instances that I've just found reference to, it seems as if these teachers have been waiting for many, many years to get a result, and they only got a result when they took action. It seems to me that this heavy equipment operators for many, many years have been coming. They've been on Q95 complaining, and it seems as if they, don't, if they did not take action today, they would not have got a result. The bus drivers, they've been complaining for quite a while. Our famous friend, Handbag from Grand Bay, 
This man has been there crying for a long time. And then all of a sudden, they got a result because they took some action. Does it look like, Ambassador Gregoire, that this is becoming the, almost the only way for the people of Dominica to get results when they are grieved in that kind of way? And in this case, we're talking about results Recommendations are being given by everybody. Everybody is giving the same recommend. All the institutions that matter, but yet these recommendations are not being. Instead, a legal luminary is given. A, I would say a. I don't know what word Dr. Andrew would use to describe the contract, but it's. I, what would you say, Dr. Andrew, if you can put your mic on? A prince's ransom. A prince's ransom. That's what you would say. It seems to me this the legal luminary, of course, you know, do not doubt his his capabilities, but it seems to me he's been extremely well paid for things that everybody has already recommended. And if that report is not going to reflect the people's will, then the legislation that is going to be proposed to go to the parliament may not necessarily be acceptable to the people if it is not going to result in free and fair elections. So, Ambassador Gregory, your thoughts on, does it look like that's a new system of governance where the people may have to go back to what they've done in many, many years ago in order to, to have their will? We need to... Yeah. Governments usually act when only when the people, if, if the people are not getting what the benefits from governance that that they expect then they are going to protest i mean that's just in my i'm 65 i'm 64 years old in my life i've been an activist my whole life i've always been in protest and i'm saying that's the only that's the only way you get the other side to yield you protest so i i, I think that they, they there's a, a certain character to the governance of this administration um, where they, they, they don't have any political will to seeing a change of government. They are afraid, actually, of a change of government. They, in fact, one of the interesting things about this government is that almost all the people in there have never been in opposition. And they haven't tasted opposition. People like me were in opposition for 20 years. And, um, you know, I, I actually learned to be comfortable in opposition. And when I did support the, this current ruling party, um, it, it wasn't for a long time because, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of contradictions in what they were doing and I didn't want to be associated. So, and people still say that I'm a labor right. Yes, I was a founding member of the Labor Party, but um, I am part of the left wing and the left wing has been pushed to the sidelines. We, we are only labor rights in name, not labor rights in deed. Um, but more than that, what I see is that there's not much of a political will by the government to do electoral reform because they might be afraid of facing the electorate in a free and fair election. I don't think they would win. I don't think the Labour Party can win in a fair process after 20 years in office. People are tired. They're fatigued. They've seen a lot of scandals. They've seen all kinds of things. Look at the, look at the issue we have right now, an Indian fugitive was allowed to come into our country. Why? We don't know. So what I'm saying is that the, the political will to be accountable, and now here we're talking about electoral governance, is not there. And you, you listen to the operatives on the other radio station, what they're saying. You know, sometimes I just have to laugh. because It doesn't make any sense. They tend to forget that they've been in office for 20 years. And when you are in office for so long, you, you, you begin to put, you wear darkers, you know, you wear dark glasses. You can't see the, you can't see the reality of things around you. And that's what has happened to many of these people who are in government. They have never spent one day in opposition. They got into government because people like myself did the work for them. And once that work was done, they kicked us out. But, but let, me, let me just say this. I could just add this, and anybody can jump in on this before we wind up. Um, my understanding, and I've been come to me to understand that maybe we should not blame Sir Byron too much because I mean, understand is that his terms only allow him to do a report. He may not be required to provide legislation or draft legislation to go along with that report and make recommendations of legislation. So if that is the case, 
gentlemen, one of the alternatives that we could have is that the people could produce their own legis draft legislation and present it to the government and find a way to insist that the government look at the legislation because we, there's a committee of concerned lawyers. There are many legal luminaries in Dominica who could put this draft legislation together based on all of the same recommendations that we're talking about and to present to the government and insist that the government consider the legislation. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. They can certainly do that. And look, so Byron only has to look at his island of birth, St. Kitts, to see the legislation they enacted in 19, 2019 or 2020. I think it's 2019. They only have to look at Jamaica to see what the Jamaicans enacted with respect to enforcing the residential component of voting. They only have to look at some of the other islands. There's precedent there, you know, and Dominicans only have to look at the legislation in the other islands to see what true, honest to goodness electoral reform, what it means, what it stands for. Because the underlying significance of free and fair elections to ensure that every vote of Dominicans resident in Dominica, every vote counts, is to ensure that it is only those eligible voters who meet those residential components or criteria participate in these elections. Otherwise, the whole thing is a sham, to be quite frank with you. If, as everyone says, there's at least 150,000 Dominicans in the diaspora, many of them there for decades. Can you imagine the scenario where the powers cherry pick those folks to vote? The significance or total lack of significance of the local vote of people who live in Dominica, people who have to work, people who have to live under those restrictions in Dominica that they're now experiencing restrictions in the aftermath of Maria, where many can't get jobs, where many are turned away, where many are ignored, persons who have spent years and tens of thousands becoming qualified, whether you are uh, an architect, whether you are an engineer like, uh, like Mr. LeBlanc, whether you are a doctor for God's sakes, irrespective of the contributions your own family has made to the country, you have been sidelined, uh, because it is perceived that you share a different political perspective. It's ridiculous, to be quite frank with you. So you, you see, that is why um, I wanted us to just take a look at this, because I, have, I, have, I feel that I would like to strongly recommend that our local attorneys, and we have lawyers outside of Dominica as well who could help, I believe we could look at all of those recommendations that are being made by us, by the OES, by all these organizations, by the local groups, all these recommendations that are being made to Sudanese Byron and the Electoral Commission. I believe that certainly a group of lawyers in Dominican upside can take the initiative, see what we can all help to see what assistance we can get for them to do that exercise, do that exercise, put together a package of legislation that reflects all of those recommendations, desirable recommendations, and all of the things that we're talking about that other people have talked about for a very long time, for years now, and the OES, put the legislation together and, and let the people, that would be the people's recommendations for the legislation, and then let the people take it to their government and ask their government to consider that legislation and to enact it into law. And I think the people should insist that the government look at those recommendations. I don't know what are your thoughts on that, gentlemen. Well, I, I would say, um, you know, in government, there is elections, but then there is direct participation. One of them is called referendum, and one of them is called an initiative. And I think what you have described there is an initiative, where the people get together, they figure out what they need, and they tell the government, listen, this is what we want. And so I think you onto something there that um, undoubtedly, if 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 the organizations that we have identified, the different speakers who spoke tonight, um, identified other civic groups and so forth can and can come together. So what that would require, Mr. Gregor, it would require some organizations, some organizing to put that together. 
and to submit that to the independent electoral commission if the electoral commission want to work in consultation with uh Sudan is byron uh, not that his word would be the uh the de definiting decision because that's not what the, the constitution says but if he is a consultant that can work in um in in in, in association with the independent electoral commission then then they can consider those recommendations so that's how i see the democracy not what Sudan is byron say is the gospel truth no and 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 uh, and and so your 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 suggestion your recommendation i think is a very fitting initiative in in terms of a democratic way of going about that process yeah thanks and and, and tony i wanted to get a comment from you because from a, you see everything has to be organized and structured otherwise you don't get a result that's why we initially when we say we talk about the whole question of getting results is a function of preparation and information and action and so on. And it seems to me that if we have so much doubt and skepticism as to whether or not the political directorate will want to implement any legislation that is going to affect their winning legacy, it seems to me the organization that you guys have, it was a very good job that you all did, a lot of work, you put it together and had this consultation with Sudan Isbagar and the Electoral Commission. I believe this organization have got together and produced reports that have been submitted already to the commission. I'm thinking that these organizations, maybe under the, or under the same group, the business forum, or whichever organization, bring everybody together, look at this legislation, and ask the lawyers to convene with them and see if we can get the lawyers to commit to put in some legislation together that reflects the will of the people, reflects those recommendations that have been made inside and outside, and then get a group to present this legislation to the government and to say, this is what the people of Dominica, through the various organizations, civil society and professional organizations, sort of across the board, because you had the churches involved in that grouping as well. This is the draft legislation that we proposed, and we're asking you to consider that and to consider implementing it into law so that we can have the reforms in not only electoral reform, but campaign finance reforms and so on, as been discussed here and elsewhere, so that Dominicans can have free and fair elections and ask the government to look at that. And I think the people should insist, just like the bus drivers, just like the teachers at the college, just like the heavy equipment operators, that the government should look at their recommendations and do something about it. Your thoughts, Anthony? Yeah, I, I agree that um, that should be a natural next step. Um, what we have done in the past is not just to organize ourselves, but to document our research and put reports and recommendations together, which has made the, um, a difference. Um, if you look at the joint mission recommendations, a lot of it mimicked what we suggested, what we recommended. Um, and one issue we have is that in Dominica is that sometimes we talk too much and we don't act enough. Um, and if we just continue talking without putting recommendations, without doing the research, without putting things together, we get nowhere and we have nothing to show for it. Um, the fact that we have been able to engage Sir Byron is because we have been not just talking, but building on what we discuss and, and putting it together. And um, we, we started, when we did it in 2019, we started by having some draft regulations, even at that stage. Um, but of course that needs resources, that needs dedicated resources. Uh, and once um, that finance that is required comes to play, I think we'll be able to get to that stage where we can develop draft um, draft bills and draft amendments to, to the existing acts. You know, you know, Tony, there's a friend of mine, his name is um, Dr. Dion George. He likes to speak about something called what social capital. And I, I would dare say that looking at what the Dominic Business Forum has done recently, I would think not only has it developed that social, secured that social capital, but I think it all it also has um, acquired the moral authority, the moral standing.
to initiate that kind of thing that I'm talking about, bring everybody back together and give the lawyers at home in that group, as well as attorneys overseas who are interested in contributing, engage organizations that may be willing to help to, to mobilize funding for it, and to have a discussion where you can come up with the, the people's legislation that they can then produce and present to their government and as their government to consider. Your thoughts, Tony. Do you think that the, the, the Dominican Business Forum now has the sort of uh, moral authority and the social capital understanding to be able to do this? I, I would tend to think that we are not the only one who have this moral authority, um, but we definitely have some moral authority to go in that direction with the cooperation of others. And at the end of the day, we have to look at we cooperating with all of those persons who really are talking about electoral reform, who really are talking about changing the landscape of governance, the landscape of the economy, and so on. And, and what we have to do is to avoid infighting among ourselves, which generally is what um, is keeping us back. Because at the end of the day, um, my ideas cannot be the only one that prevails. And, and often we find that we do not get traction because my ideas is superior to everybody else. And I'm not willing to, to listen to your ideas or work with you so that there is synergy. Um, synergy is what we need to, 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 to harness. Um, and, and I would not sit here and say that the big business firm would have the moral, moral authority more than anybody else, but we are definitely willing to work with all those parties, all those persons, all those organizations who are willing to share um, that view of making Dominica a better place, making the, the, the electoral process such that after general election, people are happy with the results, not necessarily that my party won, but the election was fair, the process was fair, and that it was a fair, it is a fair outcome and it is the will of the majority of the people. And we are willing to work with everybody who wants that, but we have to be genuine about working and we have to be able to separate the ships from the goods and all of that. Take the Wesley scenario um, today. It is reported that possibly this protest was organized not by people who are against what is happening, but by persons who are trying to make it appear that there is resistance so that somebody can come out as a savior. We have to be careful about those things too, uh, and 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 we could say the same thing for for Byron's report. But should we sit down on the sideline? No, we should not. We should make sure that we are there because the world is turned by the people who appear and the persons who make their presence felt. We in the business forum make sure our presence were felt with, with Sir Byron, and that we intend to influence how he goes. And if he doesn't come out with a fair report, something that's credible, something that follows what has been said over and over, something that's realistic and towards appropriate electoral reform, we will continue to take it on. But I'm thinking, um, Dr. Andre and Crispin and, and, and Dion, as we are closing up now, that it's always good to take an initiative. So if you have the groups and civil society, private sector, the churches already that have an umbrella group that has met and produced results and reports, if they were to get back together and convene and get the attorneys to come in with them who are competent, because some of them are constitutional lawyers, they know what to do, and take this thing and put it into a body of, of, of laws that they can that can create bills to go to parliament. And in this group, which represents civil society and the people broadly, because these groups represent the entire society almost, they could then decide, okay, if we do this draft legislation, we succeed in doing that, we could take it to the people and, and go to the communities and discuss it to the people and see if the people have been presented to the governments and say to the government, this is what the people are asking for. This is what all the international community have been recommending. This is what other countries had already done it before us, like Antigua and Jamaica and Barbados. And this is what they've done. So we're asking you to do this. 
Dr. Andre, do you think that that is something that we should begin to look at immediately? Well, of course, and 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 that goes to the very heart of the problem. How do you resolve this issue in terms of genuine electoral reform? Will you succeed in achieving that goal by making representations or submissions to Sir Byron? Or would you more likely succeed if there's concerted mass action in terms of a united front, making it clear in terms of presence, established presence, um, in terms of Dominican standing up for their rights, which from your perspective would be more effective in achieving the results that you wish. It is not Sir Byron who is the problem. In fact, he is not. But the fact of the matter, all evidence points to the fact that he was hired for one purpose, to produce the type of report that is palatable to the government. That's why the other reports were rejected as if they were yesterday's newspaper. That is the reality. So the only language that could achieve success in my respectful view is a concerted action of all these wonderful groups in Dominica who are doing things. But let me give Anthony Leblanc an example. Years ago, when they were building the Rosso Bridge, um, he was a very powerful patriotic voice in terms of warning the, the government about an injunction to stop it. Did they listen? They didn't. They went ahead. The experts told you that despite the protestations or the avowals, not the avowals, <clears throat> the, 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 the comments that it cost $18 million, it cost closer to 10 or 11. Where is the rest of the money? Where did it go? But my point is they didn't respond because the only time they respond is when somebody take to the street and block this road here or do this there and so on and so forth. It's the only language, it's the language of democracy that uh, authorities typically respond to. And uh, so again, in my respectful view, the question is, what is the focus of the opposition to what people describe it as creeping democracy, creeping, creeping um, socialism or creeping, creeping autocracy? Nothing is creeping again, you know. This is an adult now, it's 20 years old. There's nothing he stopped creeping a long time. He's running, he's galloping. You know, the question is the only language that those who are concerned about Dominica's future should come together and make it clear in terms of peaceful exercise of your rights um, that we will not stand it no more. This is too important for us to lose. We shouldn't be held hostage or captive in our own country. This is the only language in my view that would suffice in terms of bringing meaningful change to Dominic. That's just my view. I may be dead wrong. I just don't think I am. Um, Chris, in terms of your closing remarks, what are your thoughts on this initiative that we're discussing here? I mean, is that something that looks like a, that could have some potential in getting some results? Well, I think that the, I think the government has made commitments to other other governments that they will do the reform, and they are actually under pressure from some governments that they need to do this thing and get it done. So I believe that, you know, I I have this feeling that we will have a reform. Um, it might not be the comprehensive reform that we want. Of course, you know, how do you reach? How do all the parties agree on the final outcome? I would like to see, for example, uh, reach the logical conclusion of this process. And then, um, so the, the two political parties can go into parliament and both vote for that, that reform, that, that pro you know, what came out of the, of the reform process. So that there's a consensus of the Dominican people. That's what I think, that's what I'd like to see. We're too divided as a people on that question of, of having free and fair elections. We need to address that as a country. We are 42 years old and um, very soon we'll be 50 years. So we, we actually want to build a, a enduring democracy and, 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 and this democratic process. That, so that's why I have to go back to the, the Inter-American Charter, Democratic Charter, because it, it's everything that you need to know about why, how our elections, our political process for free and fair elections 
how should it be organized? The, the charter tells you. So we have a roadmap already to tell us what we have to do. That's why I'm sometimes I laugh at when I hear some of the operatives on, of the government on the other radio station saying things that are just ludicrous and, and has, is not consistent with reality. They, 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 you know, they have a kind of an arrogance that they think that they, they are the only ones who can talk. I would say to the, the ruling party that, wait a minute here, partners, the opposition forces have maybe even more support than the, the, the Labour Party. You know, because the opposition forces is not just the UWP. They're one part of it. There's a whole set of other people in the opposition. So, so well, well, that is why that is why Christian, that is why the, the the recommendation was not just for political parties, but for civil society. All these groups that got together, you remember, Anthony Liebler can remind us because he was part of that. I remember people like Pastor Rodney and the churches were involved. I remember one of the prominent priests in the Catholic Church was there in those exactly. forums right. and made a delivery. I remember the business people, the trade unions. Everybody was there. So civil society was free. It was not the political parties. We know for a fact that the government probably will not accept very willingly any report that does not reflect what they want, which is to maintain their winning legacy. We know because they did not accept the OAS, they did not accept the rest of them. Yes. So the real question is, as we wind up, should we just stand aside and look and wait, or should the people begin to organize to get their own legislation, draft legislation, prepared along the lines of all of those reports, and then present it to the government? By the government, I mean the opposition and the, 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 the incumbent, because they form the, 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 the government, and ask them to, to go to the parliament and look at this and to enact it. And this is the way I think the people can try to ensure that the government will listen to them. This seems to be the pattern of what is happening now in Dominica, the way to get results. So, um, Dr. Dion, George, I don't know whether you have the final comment to on this. Well, yes. I mean, I think we have said it all. There is no need to repeat it. I think we kind of have a consensus. But I think one of the points I wanted to make, re something uh, from Ambassador uh, Mr. Red was spoke about, was, you know, it's not about just having the political parties come together because that would be another stalemate. You know, I think uh, Mr. Libla and even uh, uh, Crispin himself talked about having NGOs involved. And so, you know, so that, that's, that's the key point. But uh, Mr. Gregor, I think uh, tonight, uh, all our contributors really touched on different aspects of, of the entire process. Um, of course, a lot of people are, uh, some people are actually fed up thinking that, you know, Dominican people are not stupid, that they know what needs to happen, according to Mr. Libla, that um, the matter is not about not knowing what should be done. The matter is about implementation. And uh, uh, we can have these healthy discussions. And I think it's worthwhile. But, um, and so this is it. We have invested half a million dollars in, in some consultation. And so where does it go? I think the point I would like to leave with the listeners is uh, we need to get these recommendations in from this half a million dollars. Uh, some of it has to come, of course, from the independent electoral reform. Uh, I'm seeing they're having consultations. Perhaps the independent electoral reform can consider some of the recommendations via these consultations. Uh, the uh, advice of the consultant can be incorporated in their decision, and then they should be enacted in law and should be uh, implemented before the next election cycle. And um, Christina, Anthony, Anthony, um, it's not like there's a total reinventing of the wheel of talking about draft legislation, you know, because what we say in all these recommendations have been implemented in some of the other countries around us, like Antigua, like Barbados, like Jamaica, like St. Kitts. They've already been implemented. We can just take a look at the draft legislation that exists in some of those countries and our legal luminaries at home and abroad can put together something that reflects the, all of those recommendations that people have been making for Dominica. It's not rocket science. How much does it take to do that? Can that be done as a next step? Because it seems to me that if you don't have something on the table, 
to discuss, you're only going to look at what the one side is putting on the table. So it seems to me the people put the recommendation of draft legislation, by all means pull something from all the other countries and there's some constitutional lawyers around us who could do that in a jiffy. How long did it take Antigua and Justin Simon to put it together? Three months? Antonio, your, your final word on this? Well, I agree with you. And um, I, I don't necessarily believe we have to wait for mm -hmm. the recommendations or the report from Sir Byron to move on. We, we should not do that. We have had several recommendations already. And it does not also mean that Sir Byron's report is going to displace all the other reports that have been and recommendations that have been made. It is another one that's going to be added and it have to be looked at as adding to the puzzle or adding to the completion of, of, of that um, puzzle piece. Now, um, I agree that there are different ways that we cannot um, deal with this issue. And the moment we start thinking that only this method will give us solution, we go in the wrong road. We have to be tolerant of each other and we have to be prepared to work with each other and also to see that the other person's position may have value. Because I've often said, there's not one way to skin a cat. You have to add each razor and each knife and each cutlass in the place to skin the cat. At the end of the day, we want to skin the cat. Let us all work together to get that cat skin. Yeah, but Crispin, before I go to Dr. Andrew for his closing remarks, I just wanted to put this again that you know, really and truly, isn't this an opportunity for us in Dominica, really? Now that we have the benefit of seeing all the legislation that already exists in those countries around us that have done it, we have all this legislation that we can review. Can't we ex look at our recommended and then put together the best legislation that exists for electoral reform and modernizing our election making in the region? Don't we have an opportunity now to do that? by taking that initiative, engaging our, our lawyers and putting something together and say to the government this, because it's coming from all of the people. This is what you look at because it is reflected in the, what has worked in Jamaica, what has worked in St. Kitts, what has worked in Antigua and Barbados and St. Lucia. We are recommending that this is what we would like to see happen. Crispin, your thoughts on that? Well, not only that, the, the, people, uh, the people want um, an outcome. They, they. I, I think in the in the average Dominican's mindset, that the this thing called electoral reform, they, they, they're struggling with it. They want to see it reach its logical conclusion. It's been taking a long time. I mean, the first time we talked about electoral reform in this country was going back to two thousand and six. It's it's fifteen years already, and nothing has happened. And and I was quite dismayed. I think that the, the joint commission, which was made up of the Commonwealth, um, CARICOM, and the OAS, I think they, they came up with, a, it was a limited reform process, not, not the comprehensive full thing that we want, but they, they, there was a, a good compromise. And I thought that the government not accepting that then, to me, was an error. Of course, one has to put yourself in the shoes of the politicians and they're saying, okay, but if we implement this reform, then maybe we are going to be kicked out at the next election. That's in their mindset. And I think, I mean, when I look at the, the reality in Dominica today, the fact that we've not had a change of government in 20 years means that there is a huge amount of fatigue of the electorate vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 um, the government, the ruling party. Now, of course, the ruling party supporters would be probably, um, they have a significant number still supporting them, but there, there is a swing vote in the Labour Party that could shift in an election. So, you know, the thing is that if we have a free and fair election process, I think we could have a good outcome. The question is, we have to accept the result of a fair process. That's all I say. So, so Dr. Andre, as you make your closing remarks, you know the reason is because it's not really, it's not really beauty this time, it's age. Um, really, the thing is, one of the things that, that struck me, and I go back and reflect on some of the programs we had earlier, and I remember one program in particular, where we had the Attorney General with us, and it was instructive, and every time Crispin talks about, you know, 
the people are grappling with the notion of what is electoral reform. But there was no grappling when the attorney general with that. He was very focused on the legislation. He was very clear to say, okay, that is what had been looked at, but for now, but we're not doing it again. This fellows came to the, the, the parliament and tried to prevent this and they filed this and that. He was very focused on that. So I'm saying if we have draft legislation that reflects exactly the will of the people, there is something that we can talk to the people about. You can go to the communities and discuss with people. So there is no figuring out what it's, it's about. The legislation is going to bring about free and fair elections. Your thoughts, um, Dr. Andre? You don't want to unmute your mic, huh? Complimenting the panelists, I think they've all done excellent jobs. Uh, these are folk, uh, they are not Johnny come lately. These are folks who be the front line of activis activism and the fight for true democracy. Um, but again, it seems to me that Dominica is at that critical juncture where we have to move beyond submissions and we have to ask ourselves, what are you doing to ensure your own salvation as a democratic nation? Um, it seems to me that what should be done, and that's just one view, hopefully not crying in the wilderness, where probably on a two page document, borrowing pieces of legislation or provisions in legislation enacted in the Eastern Caribbean, St. Kitts, Antigua, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, which addresses each of those essential components of free and fair elections. One, stated unequivocally, the residential component, which is at the bedrock of, of, of free and fair elections in Dominica, emphasizing the need for campaign reforms, imposing limits on, 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 on expenditure, uh, indicating in clear unequivocal terms who can vote, indicating clearly the need for electoral identification cards as in other islands, setting that out, we have to use the media, we have to use social media, launching a worldwide petition to be signed and on an appointed date, all the forces of democracy convene and present it hundreds, hopefully thousands, present it to the legislature in terms of what should be taking place to ensure and preserve Dominica's democracy. It seems to me that a combination of that type of action with physical action in terms of asserting one's desire to preserve Dominica's democracy um, with worldwide attention, it seems to me that would be a giant step towards achieving more good in my respectful view. Um, somebody said it is bigger than Lord Byron. I agree totally. In fact, um, uh, it, the focus should not be on Lord Byron in my respectful view. It should be or what will the representative and constituent elements of Dominica's population, what they are prepared to do to achieve salvation, not on the road to Damascus, but planned, concerted, consolidated action, which seek to bring the attention, not only of the government, but the world, what Dominicans are seeking and the fact that Dominica lags at the bottom in terms of free and fair elections in the Eastern Caribbean. We have to take the bull by the horns. We can't leave it to Sir Byron. We can't speculate as to what he's going to say or not to say, but the evidence is there. They rejected true reforms in terms of free and fair elections. What do you expect? Thank you. And um, Dr. Andre, um, as I thank everybody, I just want to admit that when you first started making your those remarks, then you started pointing out some items one, two, three, and four. I, I would swear that sounded like the beginnings of the terms of reference for this. Oh, absolutely, of... absolutely. I think that should be done. A manif well, it doesn't have to be manifesto. A thesis, to use Bernard Wilson's uh, phrase, then thesis. Use a, 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 a thesis in terms of where what Dominica wants in terms of free and fair election. You can just cherry pick sections from from 
from uh, elector those in various islands addressing each of the central components. You derive in 2021, I still use my typewriter, the persons who are much more technical, technologically advanced than I, you can devise a, a, a worldwide petition to be signed electronically with the view that on a particular date, I'm with this, and with the knowledge that the world is watching, you make a presentation to the parliament, this is what we want, we will settle for nothing less. You take Sir Byron out of the equation. And it seems to me what we should be aiming towards. And it seems to me that if you develop these terms of reference, which you can then give to this group of, of attorneys, all legal luminaries in Dominic at home and abroad, to come up with this legislation, and you can do this kind of worldwide sort of advocacy, I believe you'll get results. You'll get the attention of the policymakers and of the political directorate, but in fact, what you would have, you would have a document, which is a body of modern legislation, which reflects all of the recommendations that have been made for many, many years now and are still, are still being made tonight. And then you are then asking, the people are then asking the government, this is the legislation that we'd like to have, we want you to consider, please look at that, and we insist that you look at it. And tentatively, you can call it the People's Charter on Electoral, True Electoral Reform. You disseminate it. It's a simple, simple process. It could be written in, in one week. You distribute it far away. You have an end date in terms of Dominica meeting to present this important charter. The future of the country, the future of the children lies on this important charter. Look at what where we are. It's not just electoral reform. If it was just electoral reform, it's one thing. It's your way of life. It's your survival. Absolutely, absolutely. Once you are not perceived to be supporting the vote, you get. It's ridiculous. I'm probably biased because I know some of those folks who've been sidelined. Look at someone like Anthony. Bar. Look at many others. Uh, there's doctors who cannot work at the hospital. There's a production advisor who said, I agree he shouldn't work there because of his political views. Where else do you find that? We're not in China. We're not in Russia. Why is that the case? They just seek to enact legislation to put nurses and doctors on contract. Are you kidding me? This is what's happening. Right now, you probably can't even get Farah the Mall. You'll get Fenzik instead. I'm just joking. <laughs> gentlemen. No, a joke. Gentlemen. We get it from bad to worse. I talk too much. Sorry. Uh, well, <laughs> but I, I have to tell you that I, I found the talk very edifying. And it seems to me that we have something that we can chew on that I hope that we can, I hope that people like, Severin McKenzie and all the and Anthony Liebler and all the leaders in the private sector, all the church leaders, all the union leaders, all of these groups, the farmers groups and the teachers groups, all of the civil society, the environmentalist groups, all of the people who have a vested interest in ensuring that we have free elections. I hope they're listening, and maybe they might be willing to come together again. They've done it before. And to look at a, a, some of this suggestion as to the way to go forward to try to engage lawyers to put together something that they can then say, okay, we have something. And not depend, because if, as we say, I did, we cannot be making this about Sir Byron, because you understand that he may not even have been engaged to provide draft legislation. So it might be that we, this. This um, draft legislation may have to engage with the Attorney General who may have his own draft legislation. And so it means, therefore, that we may be looking at two bodies of legislation and the government would have to, to consider. At least they could not say they don't have an alternative to consider. And maybe some we could come out of this. Gentlemen, I just want to thank everybody. I think we had a great discussion today. I think it was very formative, very productive. Much of the things that we discussed and recommended were done before. And I believe it was very heartening and enlightening to see that we could find, wait, wait a minute, there has to be a solution to this. We can't just keep making recommendations, falling on deaf ears and things going on shelves, taking dust. Why not the people take their own initiative? 
do so we have leaders in the private sector in the in all the subsectors in Dominica who have shown that they have the skills and the will to put something together and the business forum demonstrated that easily recently as one of the groups gentlemen i want to leave it with you and anthony livla i know that you will take it back to your colleagues to look at some of the recommendations that we're making here take an initiative bring everybody together all everybody all the groups all the sectors sit again as you've done before gentlemen say to them gentlemen let us engage with attorneys to put together draft the decision that reflects all those recommendations and let us have something that we can then present to the government so the government cannot then say well they have nothing they produce nothing so you have legislation the attorney general then we can bring him on our program here if you'd like to come and we can discuss his legislation that he may have versus what the people may be recommended and we can have a debate on this but certainly uh anthony leblanc we're going to leave it to you to take that back to your colleagues and the people in dominica to see if something can be done i want to thank all our listeners all of course our panelists have been really great and wonderful here tonight all our listeners we couldn't take your call we only managed to take one we want to thank all the as crispin likes to say the friends of dominica and then of course all the persons in every nook and cranny everywhere who have been listening to us tonight we want to thank you for being with us we especially want to thank lambie and showing for keeping us on the air and um, you know and, and and controlling things on the um and directing the traffic on the at the q95 and so gentlemen it's left of me to say thank you so much and uh, everybody had a, a great father's day i had a, a very quiet one and uh, let's all look forward to better things coming out of this let's not to just wait exclusively on sir dennis byron for everything he can't be everything to everybody all right so take an initiative gentlemen so crispin tony dion irving I'm be showing. I just want to say everybody, good night, everybody. Good night, good night to the panelists. All right, night, Mr. Listeners. Gregor, thank you very much. Have a thank good night. Thank you very much, Mr. Gregor. As usual. Everybody else, uh, Tony. Good night, good night, good night everybody. Good. 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 All right, right. Lambi, take it easy. Lambi, take care. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. Talk to you later. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, right. gentlemen.